Well, she's more than just a bungle of love and joy. <laughs> Our minister, Dr. Reverend Sonia Davidson. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Thanks for that welcome, Vance, and thanks for setting the stage for what I know is a loved, filled, joyful service. Welcome to the people online, welcome to the people in the sanctuary. And how come I know it's a love filled, joyful service? I feel your love. I feel your love and I feel your joy and it is irresistible. Every time I step through those gates, I behave badly with joy, goodly with joy. <laughs> and I'm feeling it this morning and thank you for being here to share this special friendship Sunday. No. That joy that we are emanating now and generating. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we could make up, wake up every morning with a rush of joyous feeling, grateful for the miracle of what we are just emerging from, sleep. We had spent several hours totally unaware of our existence and our surroundings or anything of this particular life. While there are unknown mechanics of our body busily recording and recoding and coding and reprogramming our nervous system and our entire body, did you know that? While we're sleeping, we're not just there. Our entire body is perhaps busier. It's like the night watchman going through our entire body, and especially our nervous system, coding the wonderful things that we have thought during the day, recoding the things that we need to throw out, and just refreshing our entire body. Wow, isn't it a thrill to know that that part of us which we know as a body is as vital to us on this earth plane as our soul. It is the way through which spirit connects and ensures that our vitality shines through, shines through as joyous living. There's a book that I am reading that was given to me at Christmas, which only came to my attention to ensure that it was read when I insisted, well, spirit was telling me one thing, I was telling something else. It was, what? Fellowship Sunday, so guess what? We speak about love, right? But Spirit said, no, joy. And I said, but it's love. You know, I, make a, I have a little argument with Spirit every now and again. It's a joy. And when I contemplated this idea of joy, then I knew absolutely with certainty why joy is the appropriate topic for me this morning. There's a quote from this book. It's called The Book of Joy. I'll tell you more about that book later. But the quote says, research conducted at the Institute of Neuroscience and Psychology at the University of Glasgow suggests that there are only four fundamental emotions, three of which are so-called negative, so-called negative, that is fear, anger, and sadness. The positive is joy or happiness. Exploring joy is nothing less than exploring what makes human experience satisfying. My granddaughter, Abigail, she's my teacher, that's why I mention her in so many of my talks, as is all the young people who are being born now. They are coming full of richness to every family to teach us. So she got up one morning. It was her birthday. Nothing was planned. She was going to go to school as usual. Music lessons in the afternoon, ballet at, um, in the afternoon as well. But she just came and burst into our room and said, Grandma, I feel so happy. And do you know, for no special reason, for no special reason, what a gift 
to be happy for no apparent reason. Then she paused a while as if, no, there must be a reason. So she searched for something very quite mundane and said, you know, now that I'm 12, I'll be able to use this special app. You know, that is how we are. Joy exists at the threshold of our mind, consciousness. It's always waiting to project itself into some aspect of our lives. And we, the human mind, we're always looking for a justification for its presence. And that's okay, because it projects itself into so many aspects of our lives. Apparently just the casual, the unexpected, it comes as a, a rush of emotion. And it might just be there, just allowing us to lie in bed in the morning and just thrill to the, the privilege of being able to stay in our beds for an extra hour or so. That's a privilege. And it thrills to the sound of birds. There are so many birds. I, if for me, who is not usually an early riser, I miss the birds. But on the occasions when I rise early, maybe most of you in here are early risers. Do you hear the birds? There are about more, many, could be 20, 30. I had no idea we were so blessed with so many birds and they all have different voices. And my husband can recognize all the voices and I said, yes, that's a ground dove, that's a what. They're just noises to me, but they're beautiful noises. And that brings a thrill. The thrill of joy comes through so many things. When we were in prayer power the other night, hmm, hold on, Sonia. Lilith Nelson decided to share the beautiful face of her first grandchild. Zori, I think the child is called. And when I looked into the face of that child across miles, the innocence and beauty of God's presence was overwhelming. I started to pray. And the prayer was such that it touched my heart in such a deep way. It actually projected into my entire being the spirit of God's presence in this beautiful child. Never ever underestimate the power of a child to bring forth that joyous feeling. But you know what, I'm suggesting that we maybe just be more a little more conscious of all the ways, the gentle ways, the rush, even the overwhelming ways in which joy presents itself. And know that it is God in expression. And the more that we contemplate it and the more we pay attention to it, it's the more it becomes a constant focus of reality in our minds. Back to this wonderful book that I am reading. It's a fascinating book and I recommend it to everyone. The writers, and he has a ghost writer who is with, I don't know why they call it ghost writers, but because the person is there present. Um, it is a book which chronicles the interaction for one week between two modern spiritual giants. One is His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, formerly of Tibet, and the recently transitioned Archbishop Desmond Tutu. These men on the altar could not appear to be more different except that they're both short. But in essence, <laughs> they are spiritually con connected by a common experience of joy and devotion to mankind. <laughs> the book titled, The Book of Joy, Lasting Happiness in a Changing World, right, was co-authored by a Douglas Abrams. There's a Jewish name, so. Right? One is a Buddhist, one is a Christian, and maybe there's an undercurrent of Judaism there as well in the whole book. 
The occasion was when the spiritual giants partnered with the Igala to spend time together in India for a week. The purpose of their meeting was to interact and share how their life's journey had shaped their own spiritual growth and also their worldview. It is fascinating. During the meeting, their conversation centered around the nature of joy, the obstacles to joy, and the foundations to lasting happiness. Their conversations were candid, their solutions uncomplicated, and their life stories were such that anyone could relate to it. They were just a joyous bundle, playful bundle of joy as they interacted with each other. Their advice were universal principles and mirrored much of what we teach in the science of mind. We will enjoy the story of the spiritual path that these two men took, yet came to strikingly similar con conclusions about joy, love, and life. So, friends, I'll, from time to time, I will give you some thoughts about what they shared. But in the introduction to the book, this was a quote, a quote. No dark fate determines the future. We do. Each day, each moment, we are able to create and recreate our lives and the very quality of human life on our planet. Listen to this. We are able to create and recreate our lives and the very quality of human life on our planet. This is the power we wield. Lasting happiness cannot be found in the pursuit of any goal or achievement. It does not reside in fortune or fame. It, relies, it resides only in the human mind and heart. It is here that we hope you will find it. What stands out for me here in this passage, among other things, is how important it is that as we ourselves wield this power, we also benefit humanity. When I first learned to meditate 41 years ago, what attracted me to it was I was told that when you meditate, everyone else in your household, in your workplace, and especially those who are biologically related to you, benefit. And then onwards, I read the research which says, as you benefit, the world benefits as well. Right now, there are more than 7,000 people who meet at a particular time each day to develop the coherence which is felt, meaning the power of collective consciousness to lift the world. We can do our part. Every drop makes a difference. So Archbishop Tutu, in the conversation, there was so much richness, and I've only read a few pages, but I'm so thrilled to get back to it. So I picked a few conversations. I hope it's not too unbalanced because they were equally rich. So Archbishop Tutu was very comforting when he said, too many people in the world are too hard on themselves. You see, with our teaching, we say this is the gold standard. This is where we want you to go. To reach a point where you let the power of the spirit flow through so freely that we are in a perpetual state of happiness and joy is continuously manifesting itself. And so some people are too hard, some of us are too hard on ourselves. And too many people put pressure to achieve the external goals that may seem elusive at the time 
when we come in touch with this teaching. So he says, this is Tutu, no one ought to feel annoyed with themselves. It just adds to the frustration. Sometimes we get too angry with ourselves, thinking we ought to be perfect from the word go. But this being on earth is a time for us to grow, to learn to be more loving, to learn to be more compassionate. And you learn, not theoretically, you learn when something happens that tests you. This is a veil of growth and development. You are made for perfection, but you are not yet manifesting perfection. You are a masterpiece in the making. I love it. You like it? You are a masterpiece in the making. Say, I am a masterpiece in the making. I am a masterpiece in the making. Wow. You know, there's a lovely chant that is very comforting when we, you know, in the veil, in the valley. I heard it on the radio. Be still, my soul, and wait. God will work it out. God will work it out. Hmm. We'll talk about that later. No. So many people hear songs like that. So many people in the world are religious. If we add up all the religions, so many people are religious and believe in God and believe God will work it out. Why then, if so many say this and believe it, do so many suffer so much emotional pain? Remember, we are here to grow. But it seems sometimes that we get stuck in the valley. I remember, I think it is Reverend Elmer used to say, it is okay if we visit, right? If we visit, we're, if we find ourselves in hell, but we don't have to make a condominium there, right? Hell inverted comma hell, for you know there's no such hell as hell. What we really mean is, if you find that you're having a serious problem, of handling emotional pain, do something. Do something about it. We have the teaching, but there are other things we can do. And I want to address something that very often sometimes we in the churches, I think, may not give it enough attention, which is interesting because research has shown that in the churches there are more people who are having this affliction, if you can call it inverted commas, than there are people in the general population. It is this. Recently, some of us have become aware of stories of depression and suicide. These have long been a part of the human experience. It's not new. But with real-time internet access, its impact on our awareness has become greater and more immediately addressing our attention. So, you know, you may feel this is too sad on Friendship Day and uh, when we should be dealing with love and joy, that we should mention something that humans label as a tragedy. But I will. It is a story of a young woman, beautiful in every respect, brilliant, educated, successful, and if a story is accurate, beloved by her family and friends and admired by her fans, she took her life in her own hands and jumped from a high story building. Her mother shared that she had been grappling privately with depression her entire life, and at the same time compelled to carry out public a public persona of glamour, happiness, and success. I once conducted a workshop in for business places called Behind the Mask because it became apparent that so many people were able to carry out their everyday work behind a mask, and their coworkers did not know or interpreted their behavior as due to their personality. 
and in some ways acted and reacted in ways that actually made them more depressed. Not because these people were unkind, but they did not understand the nature of depression and perhaps expected depression, which is a physical condition of the brain, to act more like what we see when we see people on the street maybe rummaging in garbage. Depressed people function at a very high level, at every single level of society. And I know that is a fact because of the work that I do. And they function effectively. Many of them, if they didn't, our country would not be the place that it is because they were they are actually putting their whole heart and soul into finding joy through service. Sometimes they succeed. Sometimes they do not. And I bring it to us who have the benefit of this teaching that we are aware that there are such people. And it is impossible to have any congregation of 200 people where they are not among us people who need that empathy, that loving care, who are doing the best that we can. To preach at them does not help. It can actually make matters worse. I don't know what was a trigger for this young lady. I know she had lots of support. But it is important to know that as you would go to seek medical attention for others, I guess some of you would, some of you may not, for any condition of the body. Depression is a condition of the body, the brain and how the brain interacts with the body. There is no need to be afraid, to be ashamed. There is no need to feel that you are not exercising faith, as I know some people feel. And what I ask you to do is to take the teaching, hold steadfastly to it, hang on to it, but know that you are a masterpiece in the making. Joy is a permanent force within you. It cannot depart from you. It is God, and you are the presence of God made manifest. As you hold fast to that idea, you can facilitate the expression of God through your nervous system. You can actually assist the doctor in the work of facilitating that recovery of the nervous system. You, we, all of us here, can be a focus of joy. Joy is an irresistible force. It is a magnetic quality. Joy is no. I prepare myself for my own sake, but also I have learned also for the blessing of my patients before I go. And there is a... Uh, and I pray and I meditate, but there's an affirmative prayer. Infinite mind, open my eyes that I may see, my ears that I may hear, my heart that I may love. Teach me all that is necessary for my spiritual growth. Show me what I may bring to this world today. It revs me, it charges me, and I am lifted up. I am very no naughty about this. Some of you know I don't drive, and so I, I, I could go on my own, but I have a husband who is intent on driving me to work. It's so we're late sometimes. So sometimes when I walk through the door, I feel an energy that is less than joy. <laughs> When I get into my room, we pray again with my admin. 
And we pray for every single person who's associated with our life, including you all as part of the congregation. Everyone on the spiritual path with me, every patient, I won't list all that I pray for. And anyone who I've ever said I would pray for, and anyone who needs a prayer anywhere in the world, we go through all of that, right? And then we work. And I promise you that by the time these patients, they come in as if they are ready and I allow them to attack me, right? They are ready to chastise me. And then most of them, it vanishes after a few words. By the time they're leaving, they are laughing with joy. And the people who are outside are wondering, why is doctor wasting time having, you know, uh, a comedy show? It's they who are bringing, making me laugh. And in return, I laugh. Joy is an irresistible and magnetic force. I ask you, practice it. It works. It works. So I just want to share a little story that shows you how embedded. It's not just inside you. If you embed it with whatever you are doing, or it comes out even in the gifts that you may give. There's a lady, a patient of mine. She just, she just taught me how to receive. Hey, fun. She has taught me how to receive. Yvonne is always chastising me. She doesn't like when we call names, but I have to say that. Learn to receive. But this lady is so filled with the joy. She gets so much joy out of giving me. I have learned to receive and participate in her joy. So this is a story. And I have to be quick. The story is about a, a farmer who turned up at a... Abby, right, where the monks live, right? And he came to the front desk and he saw a monk and he said, here, give, I've come to give this to you, right? You, whenever I see you, you always open the door to me and I feel better. So the monk held the grapes, they were the most perfect of grapes. He looked at it with, and it filled him with just joy. And he said, yes, I'm going to take it to the abbot now, right? And he, he said, no, it's for you, it's for you, it's for you. So anyway, he, 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 he looked at it with joy for a while, and it filled him with so much joy. He said, yes, he took it to the abbot. And when he took it to the abbot, the abbot looked at it, and he felt so much joy. What a perfect bunch of grapes. Oh, my gosh. It's for me. He said, thank you. And... He looked at it and he said, there is a sick brother in the monastery. I, I, I think I will take it to him. He will, it will give him so much pleasure, right? He won't stay, stay sick for long when he sees it. So he gave it to the sick well, um, brother. Then the sick brother looked at it and he felt such joy. He felt energy, he felt better. And he said, you know, the cook looks after me so well. Let me give it to the cook. He's always feeding me the best of meals. Ah, so I gave it to the cook. The cook was amazed at the beauty of the grapes. It was so perfect. He appreciated so much more. So he said, listen, I'm going to give it to the sexton, whoever that is. So many at the monastery considered the sexton a holy man. Oh, that's who he is. And he would be best be qualified, he said, to value this marvelous nature. Marvel of nature. So he gave it to the sexton. And the sexton said, I am going to give the grapes as a gift to the youngest novice. After he looked at it, he cherished it for a while and he felt the joy. He said, I, he wants to, to experience the joy of just seeing this youngest novice enjoy it. And he said, he, if, he, if I do, he might understand that the work of God is in the smallest details of creation. When the novice received them, he remembered the first time he came to the monastery and of the person who opened the gates for him. Who was it? It was the one at the front desk, the monk at the gates. And he just felt so wonderful. He said, I must give it to him. Finally, the monk accepted and said, Yes, it was for me all the time. The circle of joy. <laughs> ah, 
What a story. Okay? So whenever we're given a gift, look at it. Feel the joy of giving it. Feel the joy of the person who will receive it. Now, the Dalai Lama, let's hear what he said. He said there are two kinds of happiness. First is the enjoyment of the pleasure through the senses. He said, I don't have any problem that he likes food, but he's not going to become addicted to food, right? He likes it. He likes a kind of rice pudding. I don't know why, but he likes it. But he says, <laughs> yes, we can experience happiness at a deeper level through love, compassion, and generosity. Just share the story. He said, what characterizes happiness at this level is the deep of fulfillment that you experience. While the joy of the senses is brief, the joy at the deeper level is longer lasting. It is true joy. He said that, and I believe him. He continues, a believer develops the deeper level of joy through deeper faith in God, in which which brings inner strength and peace. A non-believer, or he calls this a non-face like me, we must develop this deeper level of joy through training the mind. This kind of happiness, joy or happiness, comes from within. Then the pleasure of the senses, senses become less important. We do both in the science of mind. We train the mind through meditation we add, and affirmative prayer. And we also know for sure that we are the evidence of the living spirit almighty. I know that everyone intuitively has that spirit as well. And just to, um, another quote before I go on to finish. Um, Archbishop Tutu, remember he says, our goal is to be a reservoir of peace. Remember what he said about us in the beginning, right? We are a masterpiece, right? Our goal is to be a reservoir of joy, an oasis of peace, a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around us. A reservoir of joy, an oasis of peace, and a pool of serenity that can ripple out to all those around us. Wow, what a blessing we could be and we are wherever we go. He says, as, joy, as we will see, joy is contagious, as is love, compassion, and generosity. Yes, yes it is. So, friends, I enjoy this book. I put it to you, and I know that we have a teaching which allows us with daily, everyday practice to bring forth that joy which is in us as the evidence of God, to be so infectious that it attracts to us after its kind, love, friendship, and also it manifests itself in a blessing to all those who come in contact with us. I cannot leave this morning without sharing some similarities between our practice and the practice which the Dalai Lama shared with us about his morning practice. And I find that what I find beautiful about this book, these two men coming from Christianity and also coming from Buddhism, which he called non-theistic, have found commonality because we know that the one power and the one presence that lives in us knows no difference, no separation, it only knows itself. And so, 
Let me see if I can remember, and I will, because it's so similar to what most of us, if not all of us, do. The Dalai Lama was asked, how do you maintain that joyfulness that is within you, that comes out in playfulness? He says, every morning when I wake up, I feel a deep sense of gratitude for the benefit of the life that I'm about to continue to live in this form on this planet. I'm paraphrasing. Then he goes on to know and recognize that that life is shared also by all humanity because we are one. And so he goes on to say his prayers are that he may be a blessing not only to those who come in contact with him but to all humanity and that if he can't find even one person to bless for the day that he does no harm to anyone. When asked how he could be so joyful when he had been forced into exile from Tibet, he says, I do not focus on the pain of the removal so it doesn't last long. I focus on the benefits I have gained in exile. He said, if I was in Tibet, I would be in a golden room somewhere. In exile, I have met more people than I would have ever met in my life. Interesting people. I, like I'm here with you too, too, he said. I have met scientists and interacted with them. I've had such variety in life. And he goes on. Whenever we find ourselves seeming to sink into regret or despair. Try always to have a bank of wonderful memories that instantly emerge as he did. So he says, wherever I, in whichever country I am, it is home. He says, whoever loves me is my mother or my, my parent, my mother or my father. So I, in, he's implying that he creates the consciousness which attracts his blessing. So friends, joy is already here. I know the Bible says weeping may endure from my night, but joy cometh in the morning. It is comforting, but know that while we are sleeping yet, the subconscious mind is at work automatically weaving the patterns that we have placed in it. For the Lord thy God neither slumbers nor sleeps. So friends, don't wake. Wait. Wake up. It's already morning. You have planted the seeds of joy. Reap the harvest. Share the crop. You are a masterpiece. You are meant to succeed. In. Now succeed. Namaste. Let us give her another round of applause. And for those of you who didn't get the book that she recommend, it's the Book of Joy, Finding Happiness in a Changing World. And it's a sharing between the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu. And she reminds us that joy is divine. It is within us. And it's everywhere to be found. And every morning, when we hear the birds singing, they sing to us a song of joy. And if we just join the birds and sing that song, everything will be all right. Don't worry. Everybody want to join me? About a thing. Because every little thing is going to be all right. Yeah. Can you imagine if the world sing that song every morning? Yeah, oh, what a wonderful place it would be. <laughs> Thank you again, Reverend Sonia.